Good evening and welcome to the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. Let's talk art with the theme love stories. We will be listening in on a conversation between director Sarah Hall and curator Daniel Falco. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight and I hope everyone is safe and cozy inside. Um, we're here to bring the museum right into your homes um, while mother nature does her work outside. So as Kelly mentioned tonight, Daniel and I are going to talk about love stories found in the collection, but at the collection at the museum. So almost everything you see tonight, except for maybe one thing is in the permanent collection of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. So it's a great way to see the diversity of what we have through this lens of love. But first I have to do what I always do um, when I have the opportunity and ask you for your support. Um, we are right now in the midst of our biggest fundraiser of the year, Amazing Tablescapes. Um, we, like all nonprofits in the world, have had to move many of our fundraisers to online formats and Amazing Tablescapes would typically be a gala dinner where all the guests would be seated around the Amazing Tablescapes, these elaborate imaginatively conceived tables. And uh, this year we couldn't sit down together at tables, but we did have 15 designers who were willing to put their creative work um, into their own homes. So many set tables in their homes, some in their workplaces, some use their outdoor spaces. Um, we documented them in digital video and still photography. And that is the virtual amazing tablescapes that you can see on our website. So you can browse those virtual tables and vote for your favorite. Um, you can donate as little as $5. So we do ask for a donation for your vote. Um, then at the end, the People's Choice Table wins an award. Um, you can find the link to look at the tables on our website and on our Facebook page. Um, and also, before we get really started tonight, I'd like to direct everyone to our YouTube channel for more programs like tonight's. So we always record these, and uh, after they're done, they go on YouTube, and you can watch the whole, this is our sixth Let's Talk Art on a variety of topics. So you can catch up if you see tonight's and decide you enjoyed it. Um, and it's just this one will go right into the library of programs we have exploring the museum's collections and exhibitions. So now comes the fun part. We are going to turn our attention to love. Daniel and I decided to interpret the idea of love very broadly. You're going to hear about how the museum itself is the outgrowth of a love story. You will see things that we love um, as people who work with the collection, and you will see a really quick look at a lot of sort of loosely grouped items in the collection that we have somehow connected to love. So Daniel is going to run the PowerPoint tonight. I'll let him get started and the conversation will take off from there. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks everybody for coming on board to join us tonight. We've got a lot of interesting uh, stories to tell you relating to the theme of love and the collection. And here we go. This is a page here that just gives you a sampling of some of the diversity that we have in the collection related to love. So let's start things off with our museum founders, Anna Brew and William Singer, who really uh, are where this, this theme and where our museum of course begins uh, with Anna, who's from Hagerstown originally. And, oh, my favorite picture for one person. Yeah, so, this is a great one. It's such a wonderful um, photo, the one that, that Daniel, it might be too difficult for him to go back, but the one that he shows of the two of them sort of as a couple who've been married for many years, but you can see that affection there, um, which I like to think of that affection um, being in every part of the museum that they founded together in Anna's hometown. Um, so there's my sappy little bit and <laughs> you, can, you can go on from there, Dan. I like, to, I like to think so too, Sarah. Their spirit is always with us in the museum, whether it be in specific works that they gave or in other aspects of um, our mission and what we do in the collections that we have. And that is a love story resulting in marriage between them. And this is their wedding photo from 1899 down here, uh, so long ago. Uh, and of course, William was from Pittsburgh and Anna was from Hagerstown. And William was an artist. If you had the Pittsburghers on this call, knowing that I came from Pittsburgh, occasionally we, we get a Pittsburgher or two. And um, actually Henry Clay Frick um, and family, I don't know that they attended the wedding, but they did give a wedding gift 
Um, so the Fricks were aware of, you know, uh, William Singer Jr.'s marriage to um, Anna from Hagerstown. Yes, indeed. And William, though, he would spend the, his early, very early years in Pittsburgh, but quickly would move on from there after marrying Anna. They're going to become expatriates and they're going to move to Holland and they're going to divide their time between Holland and um, Norway. And as we mentioned in a previous Let's Talk Art, they also established the Singer Laren Museum, which is outside of Amsterdam. So they, they bring their uh, collecting and their patronage overseas. And they also leave. Um, some of their works also to the Museum of Decorative Arts in Bergen, Norway. So there's a very interesting story, an international one that goes with them. And part of their love, uh, uh, not only for each other, but also this love, this passion for art. And that's part of the founder's vision of the museum, this cosmopolitan world culture. And you can see that in this historic photo of their home in Blaricum uh, that they moved into in the early 20th century, where you have all different kinds of artwork. You have William's paintings that are interspersed with Chinese and um, other Near Eastern ceramics, uh, all presented here even very eclectically with European furniture. So you're going to see that as we go through tonight, the uh, diverse nature, the multifarious qualities. That's and very good. Yes. And this is uh, something that resulted for our, the museum's 75th anniversary in a wonderful exhibition called Loving Art. And this was the catalog that was made uh, in 2006 called Loving Art, the William and Anna Singer Collection, uh, an exhibition held at Singer Lauren and at Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. So, it's a really uh, cool book. It's easy to read. Um, it gives uh, so much background on you know, how the museum came to be and their life together. And it even has a picture of the wedding gift that Henry Clay Frick and family gave. So. Um, that was the first like little nugget of documentation I had that indeed, you know, the paths had crossed. Yes. It, um, and with that, it leads into our theme for tonight in terms of talking about specific works from um, our collection. And that is a good place to begin. We're actually go, um, fast forwarding, if you will, to uh, something from the 1970s by famous American pop artist, Robert Indiana, his love, which many of you no doubt no. And um, he sort of started out in the 1950s with these things. He started creating paintings of, of words that included eat and die, but he settled upon this one of love. And it was an, it's really, of course, an emotion-laden word, as well as those words eat and die. And they're deliberately meant to provoke discussions about what love means. And it's very interesting how he's also tipped the O here and um, how he's arranged them. This is, these are actually four individual silk screen prints on paper. So they're individually framed. So when it's been displayed at the museum, they have to sort of be hugged together uh, to form the perfect square that you see here. Some have interpreted them as having some kind of spiritual content. Uh, they become very famous. Some of you may know that stat, the uh, sculpture that's in um, Philadelphia. He also had a US postage stamp in 1973 that featured his multicolored love. Um, so there are different ways that this image can be interpreted. And it's a nice springboard for how we're going to be going through and reading um, images, works of art that deal with this theme. Well, I look at this date, 1962, and I remember all of the things that were happening, you know, in the world in 1972 and the importance of the message of love, which of course was in pop culture all around us, you know, in, in song as well as in Robert Indiana's, you know, very graphic work. And I think there's a little bit of a, you know, I've been seeing this a lot on social media lately because I think it's speaking to people in a very urgent way again. <laughs> It absolutely is. It's, it remains very relevant and it brings up uh, and sparks many conversations about the theme. So here and, we did, I, I think I'm having some audio issues. It sounds a little funny when I start to talk. So um, I'm not sure if that's weather related to the internet and hopefully we'll all be able to stick together through whatever's happening outside. But um, we did divide this up into kind of types of love. Um, and some of this, you know, Daniel knows the collection really well, combed through the collection, found a lot of things. And um, I walk through the galleries and I 
picked some things that really caught my eye related to love. So um, we'll see what we have here. A, a really interesting eclectic group, I think. Yes, it can really be broadly defined. Um, tonight, as you're going to see, we go back to uh, Renaissance art and um, in the, some of the earlier works that we have in the collection to the old masters, and certainly the finding of Moses from the Old Testament um, uh, fits in with this category in terms of the finding of the infant Moses and really the adoption um, of him by the daughter of Pharaoh. So this really makes for a nice historical subject that deals with this theme. And here are her maidens um, that are discovering him literally here in the basket. We're keyed into the fact that's taking place in Egypt by the pyramids in the background. And what's really interesting about this painting is that you get it all. You have a, um, a portrait, you have um, sort of a genre subject, you even have uh, two African uh, boys down here, albeit very stereotyped to are included in the painting. She's under this parasol. And then in the background, you have a late 16th century Italianate landscape. That okay. has hey. the pyramids planted to Italy. Yes, exactly. They're all merged together here. Plus you've got the look at the vegetation and the, and the landscape uh, elements in detail. And Battista Zelotti was a, um, uh, an artist, a close follower of the famous Venetian Renaissance painter, Paolo Veronese. So this begins a nice uh, foray into this. Um, on the subject of an upcoming exhibition called Joshua Johnson, Portraitist of Early American Baltimore, this brings us a little closer to the uh, Washington County Museum of Fine Arts uh, and Hagerstown specifically with the Yo family who are depicted here. And this shows the connection, the bonds of um, the uh, father and mother and uh, with their children. And in this case, you have Benjamin Yo, Sr. and Jr. And then you have Susanna Amos and Elizabeth Yo, her daughter here, cast in an early 19th century context. I think what I really love about these um, paintings is that they combine well, first of all, they seem so very American, right? It, in a way, it reminds me of looking at American still life of the period and the fact that still life had a resurgence at that time, albeit a sort of humble, humble still lives, still lives that were sort of democratic and American and direct. And that's what um, you know this portraiture style reminds me of. It's this wonderful combination of affection and tenderness that you see. I love her hand on her daughter's shoulder. Um, but at the same time, there's this dignity and there's this directness, uh, this, this, this quality that feels very American. Um, the show opens April 17th. I'm, I'm going to say that right now. We're so excited to be looking at Joshua Johnson's work as a group um, in a museum for the first time since 1988. Yes. And Joshua Johnson, um, just to, as a, um, uh, to point out for people who may not be familiar with his work, he's one of the first established professional uh, African-American artists. So um, there were others before him, but he's really uh, the one who left behind the largest body of work between the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So I don't want to do, I like doing commercials for us more than other people, but I will say that right now um, HBO Max has a documentary called, um, I think it's called uh, Black Art in the Absence of Light. And I watched it the other night and um, a uh, someone, you know, we collaborated with David Driscoll from the Driscoll Center, who's now no longer with us, but he's a big part of, of that documentary. And you see um, Joshua Johnson paintings pop up, making little cameo appearances in the documentary. So it's fun to watch for that, as well as just giving a really good grounding in the history of um, American art by Black artists um, from, from Joshua Johnson and Duncanson and others who you were just on a panel talking about. Um, to yes. So from Joshua Johnson, we go and explore some other portraits in the collection that uh, deal with this theme of uh, children and this interaction. And you can see how it was uh, children, their interaction with parents. Here's a mother and child by the artist George Henry Harlow, who was a student of the famous English portraitist Thomas Lawrence. And uh, Harlow was uh, very accomplished in his day. He uh, died prematurely there in 1819. He didn't have a very long life, but he well, really- I have never seen this. this was my first time seeing this today when you showed me um, some of your picks for this PowerPoint. It is, um, you know, one of those sort of refined English portraits, but it, it has 
has this real sweetness to it. And, yeah, it's, it has this crispness of detail. And um, in that regard, it shares with Joshua Johnson in terms of the, trying to depict the translucency here mm -hmm. of the sleeve of her dress. It's just beautiful. And it looks like the child is holding some kind of a rattle in um, his or her hand here. And it's in this really gorgeous uh, frame, possibly period frame. Looks like some kind of a, a richly varnished walnut. So that kind of attention to detail is also captured by the famous American painter, Alfred uh, Jacob Miller, who worked for a number of years in Maryland. And here he's depicted several of the Kielhofer children. The Kielhofers were uh, an important part of uh, Hagerstown society in the mid 19th century. These kids were the um, uh, children of uh, George Kielhofer. He was involved in banking, uh, later on gaslighting. Um, he, was, he was a businessman in town. So uh, these paintings are really quite lovely and detailed. And they like, look like they barely stand still. There's this sense that like they were called over from you know running around out there, and they're pausing for a moment. So yeah, it's, it's like we've we've sort of caught them right here um, in this moment, and they sort of get edge closer as Sarah was saying, they edge closer towards the uh, periphery of the picture. So there's this tremendous immediacy. And we've got this one here um, by John Rogers, who is a very well-known American uh, plaster sculptor who created works to be displayed in American parlors, such as this one, which is checkers up at the farm. And this one is a, a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I, this sits out, you know, people, I hope people stop and look at it when they're at the museum. It may get walked, walked past sometimes. But I, I think it's really interesting. Um, John Rogers is, it's, it's essentially genre sculpture, right? A sculpture of everyday life. And um, I don't, and, and it was popular art, right? So I think they yeah. sold 5,000 of these I read. Um, the most he ever sold of one of his compositions was I think 20,000. This was, I think the second most popular with 5,000. Um, that's his wife. Um, it, it feels like a family scene, right? Because there's a mother and child. Um, that's his wife, Hattie Harriet, um, modeling for the woman. And it's a story. So there, there's, you know, if we were in the gallery together, I'd be asking you to tell me the story. What do you think is happening here? Um, but we, we can't talk. Um, so we have, you know, this, this well-dressed man um, sitting playing checkers in this kind of makeshift checkerboard right on top of a barrel and uh, this this country guy I mean he's playing checkers I guess with one hand while he's <laughs> holding a hoe it looks like or maybe a rake and the other um, can you know hasn't really even interrupted his work he's on like an upside down basket but it's a kind of a uh, little humorous story about the city guy going to the country and being beaten um, and I, I found um, this wonderful, so this is, what date is the sculpture 1875, Daniel, is that right? About that time, yep. Yeah, so yeah, circa 1875 is what you have. So in 1896 in New England Magazine, um, when these were already in Victorian middle-class parlors around the country, um, the piece was described. So this is sort of of the period, they're describing how the urban gent is being beaten by the son of the soil while the child amuses himself by kicking the checkers off the board. That's a detail that's pretty hard to see here, but I love that naturalism. That is what somebody who has raised kids would understand happens <laughs> when you have a kid near a game board. Um, the whole group tells the story of the clean and simple New England life and of a happy democracy where the wealthy and the poor meet at intervals on a pleasant and manly footing. So I just love that um, little quote describing. And of course, how, do you have any idea how many subjects Rogers made? Oh, he made hundreds of them. Yeah, and, and the New York um, Historical Society has a huge collection, I know that. Yes, he mass produced them and he was very successful in his time. Mm -hmm. And I think he wanted to study art, but the family fortunes faded, so he didn't get to. He was like a locomotive mechanic or something, and then got back into making these figural groups and, and was able to make that his career. Yes. And also familial love uh, is often found between depictions of mothers and children. 
And I have here two very different artists. We have the very famous English sculptor, Henry Moore, who many of you uh, no doubt know for his large scale uh, bronze and um, uh, marble and other stone sculptures of uh, exploring human form. The Henry Moore was a very important English modernist. And um, here you have a very small one. This one that we have in our collection is very tiny, but it's quite lovely. And it shows that intimate bond between the infant and the mother. And um, then on the right, we have a work by a lesser known artist, but very important in the history of South African art, a man named Gerard Sokoto. And Sokoto uh, has quite an interesting story in terms of establishing the South African style of expressionism. And he was also very closely involved in trying to advocate for uh, equal rights of blacks in South Africa, that is against apartheid. So he has a very interesting story, he became an exile in Paris uh, beginning in the late 40s, early 50s. And this is one of his depictions of mother and child. Which so it's very, look, very, uh, very uh, looks a bit like an icon. Um, yes. Uh, how tightly framed it is. I wonder, you know, he's of a later generation, but we know that the modernists were extremely influenced by African art. So the conversation between these pieces is, you know, maybe more direct than it seems to be. <laughs> yes, it's interesting you say that, Sarah, because Henry Moore at the time, I think he made this piece, which was maybe the 50s or 60s, he's looking at Mayan sculpture. So he's looking at um, uh, art sculptures of the Americans mm -hmm. um, and also pre-Columbian civilizations. So that makes an interesting dialogue for the two pieces. Absolutely, yeah, that, that is, there is always, you know, our art doesn't happen in a vacuum. No, it does not. And from there, we move into our theme of the love of nature. And this can be defined in many ways. We begin here with uh, the Italian sculptor from the late 19th, early 20th century named Rembrandt Bugatti. Who came, he hailed from a family of Milanese sculptors and other artists. And here we've got his wonderful work called um, Elephant d'Asie or Elephant of Asia. We should put it to scale because you're seeing a large piece um, that he's doing um, on the right, but our elephant is pretty small. And in fact, it it kind of, you know, when you talk about falling in love with things in the collection, I was very enamored of this elephant in my first walk through the museum. And it's partly because at the Frick, we had a car collection and um, the Bugatti children, Rembrandt, Bugatti, and of course, all I can think about is, you know, people who name their children after artists like the Peel family and also the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> but Rembrandt Bugatti comes from, uh, you know, a creative uh, family or else they probably wouldn't have been naming their kid Rembrandt. But his brother, Atore, is the um, car entrepreneur of the Bugatti automobile. So uh, I knew his work from hood ornaments. And uh, so he's, he's had a sort of resurgence in uh, interest lately. He had a very short life and uh, was seen as, I think, and, and Daniel, you're, you're the more accomplished art historian than I am, but he was seen, I think, as connecting the Annemelier tradition that, that, came, that came with the Romantic movement um, to modernism and even sort of um, being a precursor of futurism because he um, was just, he spent a lot of time at the zoo um, actually observing animals. And he was working with a new material, a plasticine material that didn't, you know, the, the earlier artists had worked with plaster, which dries pretty quickly, but plasticine you could work with. So he could both be more realistic if he wanted to be, but he could also be more expressive in the way he rendered animals. Um, so he really, um, really is considered one of the best sculptors of animals ever. Yes. He was very adept at this, and he, like some of his contemporaries, uh, which included um, another artist that we have in the collection named uh, Emmanuel Fremier, he, like Fremier, who was French, had this un, uh, really special ability to capture the inner workings, the inner nature of the animals in, in capturing specific moments, the, also studying their anatomy and their musculature. And uh, Sarah and I were discussing earlier today how important it was for Bugatti how, how affected he was when he would go to the zoo. He would really be enamored and fascinated by these creatures. And you can see him imbuing and infusing his work with that Look, compassion. Some portraits, some portraits. It's a sad, sad story 
that, you know, I debated telling, but he dies at, I think, 31 um, after, just after World War I, he had a um, hard time emotionally. He was a stretcher bearer, I think, in the war, um, saw a lot of things that triggered depression, apparently also contracted tuberculosis. And on top of that, this is kind of um, a terrible, terribly tragic story, but he would, he liked to frequent the Antwerp Zoo to make his animal studies and they were suffering from, I guess, shortages due to the war and they ended up having to um, put to sleep many of the animals and he really had relationships with the, these animals. He felt really connected to them and uh, he unfortunately um, took his own life um, when he was only 31, but a very kind of unique talent. Absolutely. And Fremier also, if you have a chance to explore him on your own, if you look him up, he also was fascinated by animals. Though for Fremier, sometimes it's more about their evolution. It almost have these scientific qualities. They're often shown in very dramatic poses. So his take on it is a bit different. But you can see, again, the same kind of empathizing with the creatures, like the sheep that you see here. Look at how he's displayed the, and, and uh, paid such close attention to its musculature. Right, there's, it feels like less of a romantic interpretation of the animal and more of a uh, actual, <laughs> less romanticized, more in fact, it's kind of a, an awkward body on that sheep even. Yes. And from there, we move into looking at our natural surroundings from animals and we still have the animals here. This is a, a recent gift that we received at the museum by Benjamin Barker of Bath. And it's a pastoral landscape. The British artists really take to the outdoors beginning in the late 18th and early 19th century. They build upon French tradition of landscape, classical landscape from the 17th century with artists like Claude Lorraine. They go out into nature and they travel around the British countryside depicting beautiful scenes like this one, oftentimes of shepherds, and in this case, resting with their cattle. And look at this expansive view and the way that the pictures um, set up how, how, how we're meant to see it. Right, and it's, it's this era of landscape, right? When, when they're creating, again, the man is just tweaking the landscape a little to create these beautiful vistas. And I can't help but always think of Jane Austen or you know uh, early 19th century novels when everyone goes out for walks. Yes, and it's the, the pictures are very much anchored in this case by trees on the left and also trees on the right, that we often refer to them as the wings of the landscape, especially when we talk about artists like Claude Lorraine. And this is something that's gonna be passed down to the tradition of American landscape as well. French uh, have their own tradition. And as we're gonna also see today with Hudson River School painters, but before we get there, we have an artist, both uh, whom Sarah and I like very much, Théodore Rousseau, who was connected to the French Barbizon, and this one yeah, is I like this the whole evening talking about Rousseau. I am I'm the daughter of a naturalist, as I might have said um, before in, in a group setting. And so um, I always say um, there's a quote from Tandor Rousseau that he heard the voices of the trees. And anyone who hears the voices of the trees is all right by me. Um, he's just, um, you know, this is this romantic landscape. It's a time when artists are realizing they're turning away from the idea of creating Italian landscapes and this idea that you have to go to Italy and you have to spend time there. They're really feeling national pride. And, you know, the Hudson River School, we, we understand that happening in America at the same time. And in France, the Barbizon School would go to the forest of Fontainebleau. It's this convergence of things. There's a cholera epidemic, which sends a lot of them away from the city. I think Fontainebleau is about 30 miles from Paris. There are new train lines, so it's easier to get there. Um, so there's a, like a budding interest in travel um, and sort of day trips and going places. And there's this regional pride. And so um, the Forest of Fontainebleau becomes the center for these um, artists of the Barbizon School. Um, I wanna read you some Rousseau quotes. You know me, I'm the person who's always looking up quotes. Um, so uh, let's see, here's one I love. To hell with the civilized world, long live nature, the forests, and old poetry. And um, he's, he's actually an environmental pioneer because the artists who were frequenting the forest of Fontainebleau became concerned about logging. 
And so they ended up petitioning to have it actually become, I think, the first protected national parkland in the world. Um, so he, he was an environmental activist. Um, the, full, the full quote that I have, um, I'm trying to see, there's a bunch of quotes about trees. Here's, um, if my painting depicts faithfully and without over refinement, the simple and true character of the place you have frequented, if I succeed in giving its own life to that world of vegetation, then you will hear the trees moaning under the winter wind, the birds that call their young and cry after their dispersion. You will feel the old chateau tremble. It will tell you that as the wife you loved, it too, will disappear and be reborn in multiple forms. One does not copy with mathematical precision what one sees, but one feels and interprets a real world. And here's the one about the voices of the trees. From the 1850s, apparently he said this, I heard the voices of the trees, the surprises of their movements, their varieties of form, and even their peculiarity of attraction toward the light had suddenly revealed to me the language of the forest. All that world of flora lived as mutes, whose signs I divined, whose passions I discovered. I wished to converse with them and to be able to say to myself, through that other language painting, that I had put my finger upon the secret of their grandeur. So it's wonderful. It's also fairly egotistical, right? He is going to translate nature for us. He has the key to their language, but um, it's, he's really irresistible. So I've gone on enough. <laughs> Yes, and Rousseau's landscape, uh, in contrast to some that you're going to see subsequently, are not at all idealized if you explore his work more. He really, he, he begin, he's part of this movement of French realism that is looking at the condition of the landscape as you see it, um, of course, as, as an artist as he wants you to see it, but um, he will also paint figures in, into the landscape. This one does not have peasants. But Rousseau also would incorporate the people of the woods into the paintings, which was part of this uh, colony of artists that was settled down at Fontainebleau Forest. Yeah, and, and these are, of course, <laughs> often connected to as as like the birth of impressionism, the precursors of impressionism, because being outdoor indoors and being with nature was so important to these artists. Yes. And they, did, they did most of their work in the studio, right? They might do some sketching with paint um, because it, this is when tube paint first becomes available. Um, they can switch from pig bladders to tubes, but they're still doing most of their finished painting in, in the studio, but they're out there sketching all the time. Yes, we have the birth of the plein air style of painting uh, to, and um, method. They couldn't be more of a contrast to this German romantic named Carl Friedrich Heinrich Werner, Woodland Flowers, where Werner is taking us into an almost with a pre Raphaelite uh, technique, looking at how the light reflects off the leaves. It's every detail. And he's coming out of the tradition of German Romanticism, which often had very much an exacting, uh, a meticulous approach. And that's contrasted in the back with these large clouds. And he, this is about capturing all of nature's um, different um, imperfections, but also all of its nuances, even the details of the foreground here, uh, which is very, it, this looks like it's either in spring or summer. And, 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 you know, where are you? If you're making this drawing, where are you? You know, are you laying on the ground? I, I've tried to, you know, the, the kind of almost microscopic examination that he needs to do to, to get this to be in this perspective, to get this, this, you know, he may have, he may have dug up a tuft and brought it inside. He may be laying down on his stomach, who knows? But um, it is this incredibly intense examination. Yes. Reminds me, I know I'll go off on a, on a tangent, but um, Durer, you're talking about uh, tradition. He is one of the first who, there are volumes of his watercolor studies of alpine flowers and nature and this reminds me a little bit of that. Um, and he's one of the first artists to be documented as having you know, gone out and done this kind of work. Absolutely. It's a tradition that goes all the way back to Durer and the German Renaissance. So it comes all the way up through the 19th century. And somebody who comes out of the German Romantic period, who's American, is the all-renowned Albert Bier, uh, Bierstadt. And here we have in the Rockies, uh, California, from about 1870 to 80. And this shows his tremendous passion for sublime nature. And as Sarah mentioned before, uh, artists like Bierstadt 
like the, his contemporary um, French artist, like Rousseau, for example, he would go out into nature and make very careful sketches. And then he would go back to his studio and create these works like this one. This one is, you know, it's about this big. It's not one of his huge ones, for example, you see at National Gallery or Smithsonian, but it's on a smaller scale. But even it is, this, you know, America had a lot more than the forest at Fontainebleau. <laughs> there was, it it, did. That's, that's, that's being vastly simplifying on my part. Um, but yes, it's, it's this whole nation, nation with a sublime natural environment unlike anything in Europe. So that, that regional and national pride reflected in landscape. Yes, and we see that with people like Asher B. Durand, religious monument. And in this one, we have an anthropomorphizing, that is the animation of inanimate forms, in this case, trees, that are intertwined with one another, almost in this um, natural loving pose, at least some scholars interpreted that. And you can see Asher B. Durand infusing the composition with this literal love between the plants. And you this, can't ignore the cross. And so are we thinking about, about intelligent design at this point? Are we talking about transcendentalism? Tell me your thoughts, son. I think it's a combination of things, sir. I actually, when I've looked at this picture, I think it's about finding spirituality and Christianity in nature. Uh, but it's also a love for nature. It's almost equating uh, the natural environment with Christian spirituality which you see actually going on in European art. If you think, for example, of somebody like Caspar David Friedrich okay. in Germany with his cross in the mountains. I think Durand is after a similar thing, though it's in a, an American context. So for me, I sort of could re can read it both ways. It's, uh, it, it's a very interesting kind of uh, uh, take on nature. What well, and it is the period of the feeling of spiritual renewal in nature and nature being, God, you know, God's cathedral. Um, it's definitely all part and parcel. Yes. From there, we'll depart nature and we're going to move on to looking at some works uh, based on themes of marital love. And here is a wonderful small painting that we have as part of our old master's collection by the Beau Brun. Right. I, I, as we were looking at this earlier and then um, talking, and I was thinking on my own, I was like, we're calling this marital love, but we could easily call it political alliances too, because so often these kinds of formal, this is a formal engagement portrait. So often they were about allying families and, and sort of formal, um, you know, mergers in a sense of, of assets and uh, alliances. Um, but she's beautiful. I love her. Um, what, what, a, what a lovely uh, sort of ar aristocratic portrait. So this, that, that dress, those pearls, of course, you know, luxury and wealth, status. Yes, absolutely. I was asking Daniel earlier what, we think that that's a window next to her, sorry. Um, I wondered if it was a tapestry on the wall, what was, what was happening over there? It looks like a sky with variations in cloud, I think. And in terms of the idea of marriage, political alliances, that's a very nice transition to a very different context and culture, but that we see also with this Anglo-Indian style miniature of the Mughal imperial rulers, that is of India, Shah Jahan, um, Mumtaz Mahal, Akbar, and Maryam Uzamani. And um, we, what we're looking at here is the Mughal lineage. Uh, here you have on the top and the smaller ones, you have um, Akbar, and then down below you have um, his wife, Maryam Uzamani, and then you have Shah Jahan, who's very famous for building the Taj Mahal. And Say, there's a Mahal. Right. Yes, a classic story. So we have the patrons of the Taj Mahal shown in the larger ovals, and then I believe these are his grandparents, Shah Jahan's grandparents. That are shown. It's so um, obviously whenever you see something framed like this, um, it's turning it into an even more precious object. Um, incredibly uh, elaborate and beautiful. Yes. Coming over into an American context, we see how miniatures are very important in representing people like Samuel Ringel. And Samuel Ringel was actually 
a um, he was a major um, in the American Army in the uh, early mid 19th century, and he was the son of General Samuel Ringgold, and he uh, came from a Hagerstown family actually. It's wonderful. Uh, and miniatures, I guess. Um, these are really intimate things generally. You know, they're small and they're tokens of love usually. And, you know, maybe there could be a token of engagement or showing, you know, somebody, uh, giving somebody a memento of your likeness. But I think they are much more personal and intimate. And in fact, they they become their most uh, personal and intimate when there, there's a variation of a miniature called a lover's eye where people would just give each other their uh, a portrait of their eye. And that I think had to do more with clandestine love, right? So the identity is unknown, except for, for the person who needs to know, the person who's looked into your eyes deeply enough to know that. Um, but aren't these sweet? And, and the, the process of painting a miniature just amazes me because it's typically uh, watercolor on ivory, or gouache on ivory, and uh, the idea of controlling that pigment and also working that fine. I think miniature painters often had eyesight issues. Yes, they would have had to look under a magnifying glass to achieve many of these details. He's fantastic, isn't he? He could just come on over and start talking. I know, it's almost like he's about to um, emerge, emerge, literally emerge from the picture. Mm -hmm. It is immediacy. These were ver exchanged very frequently among affluent people in the 18th and 19th centuries. From there, we move into uh, an illustrator named Frederick Stu Stuart Church. And here we've got a classic story of Beauty and the Beast, of Beauty and the Lion, or the Lion's Love for Beauty, that he did as a series of etchings that were published for an illustrated version of the story. And Frederick Stuart Church was a renowned American illustrator who specialized, one of his specialties was uh, were fairy tales. And he really knows how to capture his big cats. <laughs> the mane of the lion, and then also the interaction between uh, beauty and the animal itself. So she's so she got him sort of tied up, but it looks like, you know, what he's tied up with would be easy to break if he wanted to. <laughs> yes, it looks like some kind of a vine. Uh, yeah, it's just like a little garland of some sort tossed over his neck. A very different style, uh, an artist uh, some of you may be familiar with, Will Barnett. He was a famous printmaker of the 20th century. He moved in and out of different kinds of styles, but he had a really um, crisp graphic sort of um, immediacy to his compositions. This one is an etching and aquatent of a young couple from 1971. What's interesting <laughs> is that in spite of the simplification, you can really read their moods there. I mean, they, they feel a little maybe the relationship is habitual, even though she does have both of her hands on his, there, there is a, a sort of sense of detachment or, you know, wandering going on there. Maybe some hesitation there. Yeah. Maybe they're, maybe they have Netflix on. <laughs> they're, just, they're distracted. No, um, that's a little too flippant, but no, they, they do, they have really thoughtful looking faces in spite of, uh, the simplified portrayals. An, art, an artist named Robert Ecker, we have a large portfolio of his mezzotints in the museum. And mezzotints create these almost painterly qualities. Um, Sarah and I have talked about them when we were talking about the Rembrandt exhibition, the Dutch Golden Age show. We we're talking a little bit about um, mezzotints and they have this awesome contrasts between light and dark, black and sometimes very stark whites. And uh, Robert Ecker for many years uh, taught art and uh, printmaking, and he was influenced by a number of different sources, everything from Robert Motherwell um, to early 20th century modernism. And uh, this one is called For Love and Idleness from 1980. And we have here these figurines taken off what might have been a wedding cake, and they're trapped inside of this glass cover. Yeah, and, and, and love is is also in its own little glass, separate from them, um, kind of interestingly. Although it's open at the top, they could get get there, <laughs> I guess. And is yeah. that, that's like a snapshot. I, I can't tell what it, you know, it's a, it's a, whether it's a Polaroid or just a regular snapshot there. It's really interesting. It looks like the bottom of a vase or something. 
that's what it looks like. It's almost like it's showing us an image of something from up above mm -hmm. in, uh, and it's sort of playing off of this idea of the trapping of these objects All underneath. these circles. Yes. Think of how many, so you could have a school program where they have to count the circles. And here we segue from there to romantic love with this neat Valentine cutout that was made locally in Washington County by Nancy Newcomer and uh, became a gift to the museum from one of her descendants done uh, about in, in the year 1832. And these kinds of Valentine cutouts were often made by individual family members and given out around this time of year as an expression or token of their love. There are different messages written to different family members. And then- I was relieved. <laughs> I told Daniel, I was relieved when he told me that each part was a different message to a different person because I was like, wow, that'd be a lot of telling one person how much you love them. <laughs> yes. Cynical of me. Um, but it is a really interesting, it's, it's so charming and amazing that we have it. I mean, think about how fragile that is. Carefully saved by family. Yes, and you'll note that most appropriately for today, it uh, is in the shape of a snowflake. It's which a is, snowflake. Yes, it's, it's this sort of um, wheel type pattern with these spokes. Uh, so it's very beautifully uh, put together. And you had pointed out to me that it spells out her name, Nancy. And the yes, name. there it is there. And then you have these little hearts that are mixed in and then carried out on the outside. We also have in our collection different classical subjects. This one drawn from uh, Ovid's Metamorphoses of Bacchus and Ariadne, or the Triumph of Bacchus, uh, a great classic story. This one done by an unknown Italian artist after the famous uh, Central Italian uh, late Renaissance artist or mannerist, Giulio Romano. And it shows this tremendous dynamism and movement, also eroticism that's going on here. There's a lot of sexy curves in this. Yes, there are. And um, there's no, not really any covering it up either. <laughs> we see this kind of courtly uh, love uh, aspect also in some tapestries in our collection. This one on the left um, by an unknown maker, uh, Flemish, probably made in Brussels between about 1600 and 1630. And then on the right, a pastoral scene from the 18th century, an Aubusson or French tapestry. And these are really neat because when you look at them, there are all kinds of details in them. We have these classical figures that are taking a stroll through a garden, not necessarily identifiable. He looks a little bit like he could be a Mars type figure. But here we have what looks like a goddess Diana who's seated in this niche. And then in this one, we have a fête galante or a pastoral scene that's drawn from 18th century uh, painting by artists like Watteau or Jean-Baptiste Pate or Nicolas Lancre, for example. So, and, and these you know, these tapestries usually sort of, you know, were mirrors of the lives that the people lived within wherever they were hung. So courtly love and the, the pursuits of the aristocracy, you know, uh, courting and, hunting and um, you know sometimes theatrical pursuits. Um, what is that statue? Can you tell? If what I had that? to take a guess, I think it may be Venus. Yeah, which, which would make sense because she's um, standing over the various lovers. Yes, and it's taking place outside a palatial pavilion here. You can see it up on the hill, the elaborate staircase. Of style though, this one much earlier and quite different in terms of the weave. Yeah, very decorative. Um, those weavers in uh, Brussels, though, you know, the best in the world at the time, and they could, you know, botanists can often identify the plants because they're just so good at what they do, what they did. Yes, you can see that here in the elaborate floral borders, as well as the vegetation. Quite stunning. From there, we move to um, an artist who really did look a lot at eroticism and sculpture and whose work comprises an important part of our foundational collection, and that's um, Pierre Auguste Rodin. And here you've got one of my favorites, Fugit Amor, which is a very erotic work. Um, it is quite large, the piece. It's, um, it's a very good size. And then something that's smaller called Embrace from about 10 years earlier. And then on the right here, oops, we've got a photo of the artist. This is what and he was apparently an admirer of Rembrandt Bugatti, so. Um... 
there was, you know, overlap between uh, their lifetimes. And, and I think Rembrandt Bugatti was something like it, at the Venice Biennale when he was 19 years old. So even though he died young, he had a decade or so of being pretty prominent as a sculptor. So Rodin was aware of, of his work. Yeah, and really Rodin is tremendously adept at capturing human emotion and the interaction between figures. And here you can see uh, the young man who's reaching out for his lover here and all of these, this sort of attention that's built up between the figures. As she grabs onto her hair, he tries to grab onto her body and very uh, graphically as well, mm -hmm. uh, very explicitly. And then so you have- These two are getting along better over here. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, it, but a different take on it, this one being per, uh, a bit more subdued, but nevertheless still very much about intimacy, the one in the middle uh, called Embrace, which is about yay big. Going to other cultures that we have in the collection, we have this beautiful manuscript page. Uh, subject, uh, don't uh, um, have an exact ID yet, but we know that it comes from sometime in the late 18th, early 19th century, the Safavid, late Safavid, early Qajar dynasty. Really beautiful. And it shows these two lovers under a canopy, which was a common theme that you would see in Iranian art um, going back quite some time. And we have this servant who's bringing a tray of uh, uh, food and drink, perhaps some kind of wine. That kind of love for depicting courtly pastimes, we also see in this beautiful Qajar dynasty box, lacquered and paper mache. It's beautiful. And it's not, you know, it's interest in depicting the pursuits of the court. It's not unlike what we're seeing in the European tapestries, um, these sort of pleasure and leisure time and uh, probably, you know, highly elaborate rituals of socializing and courting that go along with having more pleasure and leisure time. Exactly. And it's all set against this really elaborate um, framework of intertwining vegetal um, and uh, uh, figural elements, which is an important part of Islamic art. Uh, sometimes in Islamic art, it is often, um, it, it's discouraged to depict figures, but we do see in certain contexts of a relaxation of this, particularly in the arts of the court. And um, that you can see in works like this that were produced for an aristocratic audience mm -hmm. who favored this kind of decoration. So I want to know what's on the platters. They've got lots of food there. It looks like maybe fruit, and I can't I can't really tell. But um. yes, we have fruit. Um, we have some kind of libations. Yeah. These look like oranges that are piled up here. There's a rabbit that's down oh, below here. Rabbit. Actually, two rabbits. Mm -hmm. And here, this looks like a table, or perhaps a. Uh, it looks like an hourglass. Actually, that's there. There's a woman playing music and a cat over here. Really? So we have some very clever it's elements. Fun to look at. Definitely. You have to tell the gory detail, though. Yes, I do. <laughs> Amidst all of this pleasure, we have directly above this woman's head on the outside a military scene combined with a hunting scene, it looks like, of a decapitated man who is, uh, uh, he's still on top of his horse. He looks like he is the headless horseman. And this is a rather gory detail uh, that is contrasted with the contained environment down below in the central scene. So this one is, uh, be interesting to look more into it as to why the artist decide to, decided to include that. Is it a reference to contemporary events? Political turmoil leaves it open to interpretation. So th thanks for reminding me about that. Sorry. Yeah, I, it, it makes you feel like they're definitely like really insulated, even if it's not intentional, the sort of walled garden aspect of the pleasures that are happening and, and, the, and the leisure and, and perhaps cluelessness <laughs> that's going on inside. In a very different context, the element of aristocratic love and um, this, the uh, theme of courtesans runs through ukiyo-e or Japanese woodblock prints. This one done by Utagawa Kunisada, who was a very important printmaker in late Edo, Japan, that is in the later 19th century. 
And in many regards, uh, Kunisada, also known as uh, Tokoyuri III, produced even more prints than artists like Hiroshige or Hokusai. So these were very much in, in demand in Japan at this time. And these are just so much uh, fun to go through and see all the different things that are going on. And this one is titled uh, Play Party in a Flower Mansion. And there you have the Japanese name. And there's really a lot going on here. We have this courtesan who's peeking in here. This woman is announcing the arrival of this courtesan's customer as he's be, his sword is being taken by this woman. And he's preparing to enter into the central scene here. It's actually a triptych. So it's three parts. And yeah, look at how the artist is so the recession in space. Just stunning. It's really fun to look at. And you can see this um, where the, you know, the, this pleasure palace or wherever they are, how kind of uh, well orchestrated it is because you've got folks coming down that hallway in the background, great, ready to bring out food. Um, it's, you know, just everything's very beautiful and, uh, uh, decorative, you know, the kimonos and that screen with the painted bamboo on it. We were admiring that earlier together. I would like to have one of those for my house. And then we also have depictions of food. And essentially what we're looking at, actually, this is a, derived from a play, a Japanese play. And these were often done um, in the 19th century. Love the little fishermen in the background too. So many aspects of it that you can read like genre painting. Yes. We are approaching seven o'clock and I, we do have additional uh -huh. images, but um, we- <laughs> How many do you have? That's right. We do we have, have a lot. Let me take a quick look here. Not too many more. We almost uh, have gotten uh, through uh, everything. So perhaps we can just finish up here in a very different context in terms of uh, two people, uh, in this case, this young man courting this woman. This was, a, Robert George Harris was an American illustrator. He's part of the, what we call the golden age of American illustration. A very idealized, uh, share certain qualities with Norman Rockwell. And he did magazine covers, book covers, um, this guy. I'll tell you, as, as a mom of a son, what I see in here is, is the truth that girls grow up faster than boys. He doesn't <laughs> look quite. And, uh, and the bathing cap, earlier I said to, Daniel, what is that? And then I realized it was a bathing cap. I even remember those from uh, sort of my late toddlerhood, having to wear a bathing cap for swim lessons. But um, yeah, it's, it's fun. Yes, he was big in advertising here. He did stuff for Coca-Cola, uh, beer, cigarettes, toothpaste, et cetera. So you sort of see that uh, style there. And then a little bit about love and life passions with an artist who was part of the WPA, Federal Works Projects, a lesser known named Basil Hawkins. And this one is perfect for our time of year here with winter. This comes from the museum's uh, sizable collection, an, an allotment from the US government, deposited during World War II back in 1943. We have many I'll WPA on, prints. I'll go on a little, a little art tirade here. And that, yeah, we can talk about um, love and art and the fact that, you know, WPA and these early first government art programs supporting artists were so crucial to you know part of part of keeping up morale during during the depression and it, they're just I often tell people there are so many artists that we don't know you know very few artists become household names but they are all around us trying to earn a living and the fact that the government was able to, to support them and took that step as you know, really important and groundbreaking. And I think something, you know, it's, it's, it's a point of national pride. And so it's fun to have this here for that reason and fun because it's perfect for tonight as well. So even though we probably have, don't know Basil Hawkins well, um, it's terrific that we have this. Indeed, and we have actually many others that um, at different times um, we look forward to sharing more of the WPA. Uh, collection. It's actually quite uh, extensive and uh, diverse. And here we have, in terms of the passion, people's passions or loves for things, what better than to look at uh, Joseph Holston's passion for jazz. And Joseph Holston is an important Black artist, as well as a Maryland artist. 
Uh, we had an exhibition of his work in 2003, and we're going to be welcoming him back again uh, between late this year and early next year in an, another exhibition of his paintings that deal with the Underground Railroad. And, yeah. and people, people love this painting. When I'm in the galleries, I see people gravitating to it this dynamism of color and line and, you know, abstraction of the figures. And it feels like jazz, you know, it, it doesn't really need jazz in the title because you can feel the jazz. You certainly can. And when um, uh, Joe Holston created this painting, he was inspired by a, um, a, a, a tavern where they used to play jazz um, near where he used to keep his studio um, outside of Washington. So, uh, it's not far off from Tacoma Park there, Tacoma Station. And then finally, coming back to, again, in, uh, American illustration, we've got Mead Schaefer, who is an important illustrator. He was a student, for those of you who follow American illustration, of Dean Cornwell and Harvey Dunn, who were major figures and contemporaries of Norman Rockwell. This one was originally uh, commissioned by American Magazine in 1920 as a double uh, facing page set of illustrations that they would face one. And what's sort of interesting about this one is the woman, uh, you know, and the man, she seems to sort of be taking an interest in it, but the, the man, he's gotten off work, as you were saying, Sarah, he's undone his tie and he's kind of... <laughs> it's cold of it for sight, but he looks weary to me. He looks like he went to go fishing to just like forget whatever bad day he had. And, you know, but maybe, you know, he's hooking her, I, you know, and it's funny the way it is set up, the currents in the stream almost connect, even though they're separated on facing pages, you said. Um, I love her coordinated lipstick, rouge and bandana. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he, he looks like he's had a hard day. He certainly does. And she's got on her, um, her fishing pants here. She's got her boots too. And she's, you could tell she's really a pro. But he's not, I mean, he's just resting up here on the rock. So he's got a book too. So he didn't a, expect to find her, I guess. You know, he's got a book. Exactly. He expected for some solitary time. So he definitely um, got lucky that day at the fishing hall. So that uh, concludes what we brought along for images, but we'd be happy to take some questions. There are any. Very fun. For me, you know, I, I've only scratched the surface of learning about the collection. So this is a great way for me to keep um, learning about more things. Um, and the theme, let us have some fun. Um, you, you certainly pulled some things out of, store, out of storage um, that folks haven't seen lately. We got to kind of talk up um, two upcoming exhibitions, Joshua Johnson and uh, Joseph Holston, but of course you did show the one uh, piece that you want to bring out and hang while we have Bernini and the Roman Baroque. So we can talk about that exhibition as well, which is coming um, at the end of June uh, that we're really excited about. Um, but it is, we have a great collection. We have a really eclectic, diverse collection. It, it does speak to the passions of our founders, our originating love story. I hope, hope we have a love story with the community. I can be cheesy, but that's one of the reasons I came here is because I felt, um, you know, that four generations of families had enjoyed the Saturday morning youth art program. And there is real deep connection between the museum and the community. Um, and that's lovely. Definitely. So it's, it's been really fun to, to sort of dig into the collection this evening and to explore different kinds of love stories. And this sort of opens up also for me, for, for both of us thinking about the collection in a different way from um, a, a, a sort of a, an interesting perspective. So uh, we're not really getting any questions, and that may be partly because of the fact that it was such a broad topic and we weren't really teaching about any one particular thing, um, but it, it certainly was, was really fun. Oh, there's something in Q&A over here. Um, you mentioned that the Henry Moore sculpture was tiny. Approximately, what are the dimensions? Um, I would say that it's about um, seven, eight inches high by probably four wide. So it's it's not. Was it big. like a sketch? Was it a modello for something that he was going to do larger, or was it in 
tended to be that size. I would would have to look into it more. Um, Preliminary um, uh, research and examination, it didn't seem to be a sketch because he made a couple of them. So it's possible he may have envisioned them as, as a as an addition or as a they're, as they're a like set. John Rogers for the modern era. Yes. But that probably one that, for people with a bit more money too. Exactly. The one that I showed though is actually quite heavy for such a tiny piece. It's it's a very um, uh, substantial work <laughs> in terms of its weight. Right. So so bronze. It's bronze solid. It is bronze solid. Excellent. Well, this was lots of fun. Um, Thanks everyone for logging on and being with us tonight as usual. The recording will go on our Facebook page. I'm sure um, it will go on our YouTube channel. I'm sure we will post it to our Facebook page. Um, It also will go on our virtual learning page of our website. Kelly, do you have anything you wanna add at the end? No, um, if if any of you are interested, um, I have been putting attachments in the chat to some of the images you were you were talking about, and those are our today challenges. So if you have kids at home, or if you are somebody who just likes to sketch in a uh, sketchbook, you know, and keep a journal, you can use any of those prompts and share them with us. Um, and again, they are using some of the uh, images that were talked about tonight. So I hope you get a chance to click through there. Um, and then after this comes down, you can go to our website and in the virtual learning section, uh, there's so many resources there for you to um, go ahead and explore. So I'm getting a message that Roger raised his hand, but I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> how do we? <laughs> uh, I'm going to allow Roger to talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go ahead, Roger. That's great. I just want to say this was terrific and I enjoyed it. And Daniel, women wear waders and guys can fish anywhere they want to. (laughs) (laughs) You guys did a terrific job. It was great tonight. Good night. Thank you. I think we had one other raised hand. Do you see it, Kelly? Thanks, Roger. Said two people raised their hands, but no, I I can't. Maybe I just didn't put Roger's hand down. When okay. Was All right. Okay. Well, if you are out there and raise your hand. I'll lower my hand. There you go. <laughs> well, if you come out and say two people raise their hands, I got the message. But um, anyway, uh, sorry, I have trouble multitasking when I'm on camera. Um, so this was really lovely. Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, check out all of our virtual offerings and do go online and look at Amazing Tablescapes um, and do what you can to support the museum. Have a lovely night, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. I'll blow kisses for Valentine's Day. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. (laughs) Bye.